Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk today about uh, emergencies in endoscopy, which is a topic that the endoscopy uh, crew has asked me to do for a while now. Um, just to go over a couple of different things that can go on over there. Now it does, I'm not going to cover everything. I'm just going to cover some of the high points. Okay. So here's a couple of the topics I'm going to go over. Um, hypoxia, which is probably the biggest, uh, thing that you're going to run into in endoscopy. Um, and then some of the different reasons for hypoxia, uh, which are some of the other topics like over sedation. Uh, we're going to go over ways to reverse uh, over sedation when you run into those problems. Um, aspiration, which can occur uh, and is also not too terribly uncommon. Um, and then bleeding. And then they wanted me to go over kind of how pediatric inductions function um, and stuff to watch for with those. So that's kind of what we're going to hit on. Um, I did have some other topics that we were going to do too, like... Uh, they asked me to go over MH, which I think should probably be its own lecture. Uh, they asked me to go over um, critical lab values, which is just kind of vague. Like um, that, that could be its own like hour long lecture of like, what would make me not want to go anesthetize a patient? I mean, that's, that's like, there's books on that. So anyway, we will, um, not cover that today. So, this is kind of, uh, for those of you that have never done anything in endoscopy, here's kind of how this works. Um, there's two different types of anesthesia that can go on in endoscopy. We've got uh, a lot of conscious sedation that occurs over DHIM, as well as here in the main OR endoscopy. Um, anesthesiologists are usually not involved with conscious sedation. That's something that they run themselves. Uh, and they usually use some sort of cocktail involving Versed and fentanyl. Um, we get called in as anesthesiologists when we are doing a general anesthetic. And the term general anesthesia here, and, and just kind of in general, is that a patient would be unresponsive to a painful stimulus. That would be the goal. Obviously, I've done lots of general anesthetics that they have been responsive to a painful stimulus and they move and the surgeon yells at me and those sorts of things. So um, the, the key is the what your goals are. If my goal is for them to not move whatsoever, um, then it's a general anesthetic. Uh, most often these uh, endoscopies will involve a patient's natural airway, meaning that they don't have an endotracheal tube in place. Uh, we trialed some um, superglottic airways for a while that have an endoscopy port. Uh, I think those ended up just being expensive more than anything. Um, but a lot of this is just patient breathing on their own, which really is the root cause of a lot of the problems. Um, and another note on here, whoever's administering sedation, whether it's me or whether it is a nurse or whoever, um, they cannot have additional responsibilities. That's kind of the definition of, I don't know who regulates that, but it's a recommendation at least from the American Board of Anesthesiology and stuff like that. If you're the one pushing any sedative drugs, your sole focus is on the patient's vitals, their breathing, and those drugs. Um, you can't be going and getting other supplies and things like that. I'm sure we'd cut corners and do it from time to time, but the focus needs to be on the patient. What drugs do nurses use if they're doing a conscious sedation? Oh, you're good. Uh, one more time, what drugs do nurses well, use? Yeah, the... if it's just a conscious sedation, like mm. what, is it fentanyl and Versed? It is usually fentanyl and Versed. Um, and we'll get to why they use fentanyl and Versed here in just a little bit. Uh, okay, so the first uh, issue that we'll run into is probably the biggest issue in endoscopy, the most common thing, is hypoxia. Hypoxia is defined as not a lot of oxygen going on in the bloodstream. We notice this based on oxygen saturation, which is little pulse ox you put on a finger, um, spits out a number type thing. There are things that can make saturation different from actual hypoxia in your bloodstream, none of which really occurs in endoscopy. You can pretty much guarantee that if the pulse ox is low, the patient is not receiving good enough oxygen. 
Um, this can be due to a lot of causes. The most common reasons that people are not breathing good are over sedation, which seems to be my favorite thing to do to patients. Um, you give them a little bit too much too quick, they quit breathing. Um, and then you've got to deal with the consequences of that. Uh, it can also just be from simple airway collapse when you administer any sort of sedation to someone who has obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, things like that. Um, they can lower their respiratory drive enough to where a little bit of obstruction just causes no airflow and they're going to desaturate. Um, occasionally, and you see this more in pediatrics, is that you can have compression from an endoscope actually block off their airway. Again, not a whole lot in adults, but you do see that um, if you're using too big of a scope. Uh, you can also run into problems like things going in the airway that uh, aren't oxygen, uh, meaning aspiration. This can be aspiration of um, gastric contents. This can be very frequently aspiration of uh, lubrication that can go on, that can really make things upset. Uh, I didn't add this on this slide, but laryngospasm can be part of that as well. Again, you get a little bit of, of goobers or something like that on the vocal cords, um, and you set off this cascade of just not breathing appropriately. So those are some of the big reasons why this occurs. But now let's find out what should we do on this. Um, for those of you that have been watching my other lectures or participating in my other lectures, you'll recognize this picture. I got it from up to date, and I'll go over that in just a second. So what do you do? You get a patient that's hypoxic in endoscopy. Maybe the procedure is still going on. What are things you can do? Um, first off, you just need to give oxygen, right? Uh, this can be via nasal cannula, depending on what kind of uh, risk factors and things that the patient has. It can be um, a mask. We have these things called palm masks, procedural oxidation mask or something like that. Anyways, it's a mask that has openings for uh, uh, EGD scope, it has nasal openings, I guess, for like bronchoscopes, things like that, that you would insert through the nose. Um, and so that's a, a good way to just kind of flood their airway with oxygen. So once you've accomplished that, you should pretty much move on to some of these other methods. Um, I don't know, occasionally you can just do one thing and it fixes stuff, but you should definitely be paying more attention to number two as well, uh, which is mechanical support some different way to support the airway. Uh, very commonly jaw thrust, right? So in the picture, this particular uh, person is demonstrating a Larson's maneuver, also known as a uh, uh, laryngospasm notch, where you kind of push, there's a kind of a bunch of ganglia kind of behind the angle of the jaw. You push in, you pull forward, um, it is very stimulating and usually will bring patients from a deeper plane of anesthetic up to a more shallow plane because of that stimulation and they will increase their respiratory drive. Um, it also will open up the back of that hypopharynx if they're having any sort of compression from the scope, if they're having um, uh, any sort of airway collapse from sleep apnea, things like that, it will open that up. Um, I did mention oral airway and nasal airway on here. If you were currently using uh, the mouth for like an EGD scope, you can't really put in an oral airway. Um, but you can do this jaw thrust and, and hopefully accomplish the same sort of results. Nasal airways are appropriate as well. Um, sometimes they cause nosebleeds, which can just amplify the problem, and that's not fun. So be careful of those things. Um, suctioning of secretions. If Phil Jaffe was here right now, he would definitely highlight this one. Um, so again, you get a lot of different secretions and things around the vocal cords that, that stimulates the vocal cords to do something like laryngospasm. Um, you want to get all those secretions out. It can either, it, well, it can be secretions, it can be lube, it can be anything. So uh, remove whatever from the airway so that you can have a better passage of oxygen through there. Um, occasionally you have to stop the procedure until the hypoxia can resolve. Um, if an anesthesiologist is there, this should totally be at their discretion, no questions asked. If we need to stop the procedure, just pull the scope out, stop it, let's stabilize the patient, maybe intubate them, whatever you need to do um, to kind of uh, 
get a hold of the situation. Okay, let's go into over sedation. This can be a cause of hypoxia. Um, and that's really the only reason we don't like it. Uh, if a patient's nice and sedated, not moving and things, we don't really care. It's when they quit breathing that it really presents a problem. Or they've been laying in PACU for four hours and they're still asleep. That's, that would be no good at that point. So uh, here's some common agents I listed. Again, if you're undergoing conscious sedation, people are very comfortable with giving the Dazolam, which is Versed, and Fentanyl, which no one calls it Sublimase, but that's actually the brand name for Fentanyl. Um, it's been out long enough that no one refers to it as that. If uh, you're an anesthesiologist or someone who is like an advanced practice person um, and you're comfortable giving propofol, that is a really good common thing to give. Um, for different endoscopy procedures because patients seem to be a lot less responsive and cooperative with the exam. Um, I already mentioned that too much of this can, reser can result in apnea and things like that. Um, and for those of you administering conscious sedation, if they do not respond to pain, you are now providing a general anesthetic. That is usually outside of the scope of your practice. If you're not supposed to be doing that. So um, kind of be careful with where you go down, you know, the line. Uh, let's go over some reversal agents. So I've given too much Versed. Uh, the reversal agent for that is called Flumazenil, also known as Romazicon. Um, in this institution, uh, it's supplied in these 5 ml vials that are 0.5 milligrams per vial. So that's 0.1 milligram per ml. You're going to draw this up and administer it uh, 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per minute until uh, the resolution of symptoms. You do not want to give this really fast and really hard and just give the whole syringe all at once. You can actually precipitate seizures with this. Now, it's usually more common in people with seizure disorders, um, but if uh, somebody's not breathing and you can, uh, you know, relatively bag them and keep them sort of stable until you can get them reversed, uh, these reversal agents do work really quick. So if you can get away with it, don't blast them with any sort of reversal. Um, for uh, fentanyl, if you've given too much fentanyl, this is usually the most common reason someone wouldn't be breathing, um, being that midazolam isn't too much of a respiratory depression depressant, but it can be in the setting of also giving fentanyl. Um, so the reversal agent is very well known. It's called naloxone, also known as Narcan. This, in this institution, is pretty concentrated. It's supplied in 0.4 milligram per ml vials. It's a 1 ml vial. You only need to give that vial if you need to rapidly pull someone out of a deep slumber, and they will rapidly come out of that deep slumber if you give that whole thing. So I recommend you give uh, that in 40 to 80 micrograms per minute until resolution of symptoms. And I'll go over kind of how you can draw that up. Uh, I feel like most of you that have ever given that drug already know what I'm about to say. So uh, then we move down to propofol. If you're giving propofol, there is no reversal for propofol. And it's the, it pretty much anyone giving propofol, I really hope knows that. If you don't know that, you should not be giving propofol. Um, the only thing that can actually reverse the effects is timing. We often talk about metabolism and, oh, they're rapid metabolizers. You don't actually metabolize propofol for its offset. There's a difference between offset and metabolism. It takes a long time to metabolize propofol, but it's really lipophilic. So when you give it, it works for about five minutes, and then the patient wakes up, not because they metabolize the drug, but because that drug has been sucked into all the lipid tissue in your body. Um, Schwann cells and fatty deposits, things like that. Um, so that's really the offset of propofol, it's just time. Again, only use this drug if you're comfortable with doing that. So here's kind of how you draw this up. Fumazenil, super easy. You just draw it up in a syringe and give it. Uh, one cc at a time kind of thing. So I'm not really going to go over that. What I'm going to focus more on is to the right of the screen. Um, for naloxone or uh, 
Narcan, you're going to take a flush. The best practice would be to squirt one cc out of the flush, but it doesn't really matter. You're still getting very close to that concentration. Um, and you're going to draw one cc into 10 cc's. So each cc, instead of 0.4, is now 0.04, which is Instead of milligrams, you could refer to that as micrograms. There is a thousand micrograms in a milligram. Um, and for me, I get lost in the decimals and the zeros and all that. And so I just say, I'm going to give 40 micrograms of naloxone. Um, again, if you want, this is for if you're reversing it, but uh, don't necessarily want to completely rip them out of it, uh, which can be rather unpleasant. Um, some say this drug can even cause pain, even though you're not really receiving a painful stimulus. Anyways, um, so you're going to give like 40 mics, maybe even 80 mics. So that's one to two mLs every minute. Um, again, if you need to rapidly get someone out of it, go for it. Give them the whole thing. But once you do that, game over. You can't really give fentanyl for at least a little while because it will not work. So now we'll move on to aspiration. This is usually a pretty bad deal when this goes on. Um, so aspiration is, is uh, the big thing we refer to aspiration is when gastric contents come up. And this, these are hopefully in NPO patients, but as we know, people have uh, different conditions that can predispose them to things like reflux and, and just problems with aspiration. Maybe they're getting an endoscopy procedure because they have a gastric outlet obstruction. Maybe they have biliary reflux and stuff just moves backwards into the stomach. That's pretty common. Um, so things predisposing to, um, I kind of wrote this kind of funny. I'll, I'll do this in kind of a different order. So risk factors for aspiration. I'm going to start at the lower half of those risk factors. Extremes of age. Apparently, uh, anyone less than six months of age, I put a comma there, but that's supposed to be a less than sign, less than six months of age or anyone over 70 years old uh, seem to have a higher incidence of aspiration, ASA 3 or greater, so people that are a lot sicker, uh, people with sleep apnea have a higher risk of aspiration for some reason, and those with obesity. So, uh, also, people with really bad reflux can have aspiration. And so now I go to the first half of that risk factors thing. What are some conditions predisposing to reflux? Well, if you have a bowel obstruction or a gastric outlet obstruction or something like that, all of a sudden our, NP our NPO times don't mean anything. And so you're going to have a full stomach with pressure up on that lower esophageal sphincter. That's going to, once I put you to sleep, that's going to cause everything to rush upwards and that's not good. Um, anyone who's not in PO, so let's say uh, some sort of emergency procedure where we can't, we don't have time to wait for you to be in PO, or patient's just a dirty liar and they told you they're in PO and they're not. I've had that happen too. Dirty liars. Um, <laughs> patients that are pregnant. Uh, that baby is kicking the stomach and that causes a lot of issues with stuff just wanting to come backwards. That also causes a little bit of a gastric outlet obstruction as well. Um, being pregnancy sort of, uh, being pregnancy, being pregnancy sucks. Um, so, uh, and hiatal hernias. This is, this would really just become a pocket of the stomach that doesn't participate with the rest of the stomach. And so it can harbor liquid and food and things like that. So... Um, the only way to actually prevent aspiration is to have an endotracheal tube in place. And even that doesn't necessarily guarantee, it almost guarantees that you won't aspirate, but there are weird conditions where you can get stuff past an endotracheal tube into the lungs. But anytime a patient has an open airway, they're at risk for aspiration. You're hoping there's nothing in their stomach. So hopefully they don't, but that sometimes isn't the case. So if a patient does aspirate, the first thing you're really going to notice is usually a lot of coughing. Even if a patient is under a general anesthetic, they, that is so incredibly stimulating they're going to cough. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen and you will notice hypoxia is like the first cause uh, because they have all this stuff in their lungs causing an issue. Hopefully you have more of a heads up than that. And so... Um, the treatment for it, if, if it occurs, 
really quickly put the patient on their left side. In endoscopy, for all endoscopy procedures, we have a pretty standard, unless we have a better uh, a reason not to, is we have the patients on their left side. This is the reason we do that, is so we can have gravity assist us in getting stuff away from the vocal cords if possible. Um, being able to turn a patient onto their side, and it, I said left lateral position, but in, in the practice it doesn't necessarily matter which side, you just need to get them on their side. So this will reduce the amount of liquid that can enter the trachea, um, and hopefully you can stop making it worse. Um, suction the airway. This is only really going to help you for stuff that is not yet in the trachea. So if uh, there's already a lot of liquid down in the trachea, hopefully the patient coughs and can mobilize that stuff and get it out. Um, but at that point, it's kind of damage done. Uh, this is where I usually kind of have a pause in my brain and I kind of look at the situation again. What's about to happen next? You kind of reassess the whole situation. Do we need to offer different airway support? Is, do I need to intubate this patient? Is a mask going to be sufficient? Do I need to wait and see kind of what happens next? Um, along with that going on, are they even done aspirating? Could I intubate a patient and have them not aspirate anymore? Or is there going to be, like, if, if their stomach is truly just ridiculously full, maybe putting a tube in is quicker and easier than trying to go in and vacuum out whatever's left in their stomach. So this is kind of this magical moment where you have to make a lot of different decisions um, as to what to do next. Uh, and along with that, if someone very obviously is aspirating a gastric contents and they're starting to get hypoxic, I usually try to stop the procedure. Um, it's probably good practice to just stop what you're doing and make sure this patient isn't about to spiral downhill, um, as is so often the case. So, uh, do you do you continue the, continue the procedure? Do you abandon it? That's that's kind of where you need to figure out where you're going. Um, I didn't add this on here, but like, what do you do afterwards? Supportive care. Uh, make sure they're breathing good. Um, there are occasions where someone aspirates so much that I have to intubate them. You would put down suction catheters and get out as much as you can. You would end up in ICU, those sorts of things. That is not the majority of aspirations. Like, as I was training, I totally thought, like, that's every aspiration. You're going to intubate them, and they're going to go to ICU and all these things. Um, more often than not, it's a little bit of stuff. It looks real dramatic because it's very irritating, especially once you get into your lungs. Um, it usually involves stomach acid, which causes kind of an aspiration pneumonitis, more than a, we love saying aspiration pneumonia, but m most aspirations don't actually cause a pneumonia per se. They just piss everything off. Um, and that leads to swelling, which leads to hypoxia and things like that. So it's not necessarily a bacterial issue, but it can be. It's more um, just kind of supportive care type thing. Uh, I like to keep patients a little bit later. So like if, if you're getting an EGD and you aspirate, I may take you to PACU so that a PACU nurse can watch you for a little bit. Um, if you're more stable, I might just take you to same day surgery and tell the same day surgery nurses, really watch, like, let's keep this person here on a pulse ox for a couple of hours longer than we normally would and let's see if this really turns into anything. If they're doing super and they're on room air, they're probably okay to go home. There's a lot of debate in the medical literature as to whether or not you should wait for an aspiration to blossom, meaning that like it takes several hours for that inflammation to really crescendo and you could theoretically let someone go home and then they could have problems and they'd come back. Um, I haven't seen that so much. Normally patients that are gonna do that, you can't get them off oxygen. Um, it's more of an issue before you get to those later stages. But it's something to consider, especially if you work in same day, um, you need to know this patient aspirated. We think it's a big deal. We don't think it's a big deal. You know what I mean? Okay, bleeding. 
Here's a fun topic. Uh, bleeding happens all the time in endoscopy, and it is not usually a big deal until it is. Um, I'm just talking about big bleeding for this particular thing. For those of you that uh, don't work in endoscopy very often, um, sometimes we go do endoscopies because someone's anemic, or we have evidence that they're having a GI bleed, and we get in there, and all hell breaks loose. Um, this usually occurs from, if we're doing an upper scope, esophageal varices. Uh, if we're trying to band them, sometimes that doesn't go the way we want it to, and it pops one of those really high pressure vessels. Um, you can have an ulcer in the stomach that maybe has a vessel associated with it. Those can be kind of problematic. Um, if uh, we're doing a lower deal, you can run into different cancers and things like that. Normally, we're maybe doing a little biopsy and that's it. A lot of the significant bleeding comes from upper scopes, right? Okay. Um, upper GI bleeding is obviously more dangerous because you have an airway that I've already said is usually not innovated, um, depending on what all we have to do. I'm getting to where I've done a lot of like esophageal variceal banding with just a natural airway. I should probably get more conservative and just start intubating those people because the if you do run into bleeding, it is just that much more catastrophic um, if someone doesn't already have a breathing tube in place. It's normally we can give blood as fast as someone's losing it. So I can kind of fix that portion. But if I can't make you breathe better, you know, if you're having blood go into your airway, which will, by the way, dehydrate, solidify, and just create a big blockage. Um, so anyways, uh, definitely make sure that the patient can breathe appropriately in a breathing, in a bleeding situation. I put this on here. This hypoxia will kill them much faster than any bleeding will. Yeah, I'm going to stand behind that. I don't think there's ever a situation where hypoxia won't kill you as fast as bleeding. Um, so here's kind of a to-do list. Uh, I would love for this to be in order, but maybe it isn't. Um, so let's kind of go down the row. The first thing you need to do is, is make sure you have adequate help. That's something you can scream really loud and hopefully get people to come in and help you out. Um, I can't really speak much for how DHIM is organized. I know there's people all over the place, but there's a little bit of distance between them. Over here in endoscopy, you could, you could yell for help and people would come running. Like, everybody's kind of just right there. Um, and they would probably know exactly what's going on. So, who, who all do you need? You, you need, at the bare minimum, a person to be assisting in the procedure because we can't really stop bleeding without stopping the bleeding. And so that's going to require both the physician doing the procedure and at least one other person helping them, sometimes more. You need a circulating nurse to go get supplies and to help uh, assist with the actual procedure. Um, you're going to have at least one other person monitoring vitals and sedation whether that's an anesthesiologist or not. Um, and in this situation, you need at least one other person to help with whatever's going on. If, if you need to be an additional runner and help circulate a nurse, that's cool. If you need to be helping hold an airway while someone does stuff, that's fine. If you're gonna be the person to go get the blood and bring it up and string it up, I mean, at this point, we just need hands, you know what I mean? Not only do we need ANDS, but you need to know how to do all these things as well um, because this can decompensate very fast. So blood needs to be ordered. A lot of the patients that I, I feel like most bleeding we have a heads up on, like we're going in there because of anemia and then something crazy happens. I don't think it's just like this blindsided, we were totally unprepared for this bleeding, though that obviously happens. Um, but getting blood upstairs to the patient to help resuscitate them is probably the rate limiting step, I would just assume. Um, you could probably control bleeding faster than that. You can probably intubate the patient faster than that. But it may take a minute to actually get blood uh, where it needs to go. Um, there are devices that can help with things. Uh, I know we have Blakemore tubes, right? Do we have things like Minnesota tubes and that other thing? Or do we just have Blakemores? We just have Blakemores. 
they're all kind of the same. The only difference is like one extra. Right, right. So for those of you that don't know, um, a lot of the massive catastrophic bleeding is varices, and they have this cool thing called a Blakemore tube where you put the tube down the esophagus, there's a balloon that blows up in the stomach, and then you pull on that tube Usually, like the real uh, dramatic version is you put a football helmet on the patient and you tie this thing to the football helmet to keep traction on it. And then there's another balloon that blows up in the esophagus and it kind of tamponades everything. I've never used this. I've never seen one. It's a bad day. It's a bad day. It's a bad day when you see one. Everyone takes it really seriously when you come running in with a helmet. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure that looks hilarious. But, uh, yeah, it... It's something that's been in use for a long time. There's different versions. Like I said, Minnesota is a different type of tube. Same sort of thing. We're going to hold pressure from inside the esophagus. Um, you can use different agents to kind of help with this. Uh, ice water will help uh, vasoconstrict the vessels. Epinephrine, you can put in the ice water or whatever. Um, just washing the area with epinephrine can sometimes reduce bleeding. Um, sometimes we will inject epinephrine around different things. Um, you can use hemostatic agents. A couple of the different brand names are Endoclot, Hemospray is another one. White powder basically that causes a lot of clotting really quickly can help with these things. Um, Clips are another thing. Clips look like little alligator teeth and you just go in there and clip the mucosa over on itself and it kind of holds pressure on itself is essentially what happens. Probably very difficult to place during rapid blood loss, but that is another thing we can do. Am I missing anything on here? Anything else that cautery, cautery can help with bleeding. I didn't add that, but that can help. Um, now that we're actively stopping the bleeding, hopefully. I mean, there have been situations also, I, sh I should add this kind of to the agents to stop bleeding. Um, there was a time that we put a stent over, uh, I was with Generoso, we placed a stent in the esophagus to hold pressure for the bleeding and sent them to IR for like an embolization. So we've done that before. Um, this is kind of an optional thing, but you can also um, put in another IV so you can get better access to then give blood if you're having an issue with that. Um, obviously, that comes a lot later because you're kind of focused on other things at first. And then um, kind of a note on how much blood to give. Are we having massive bleeding? Do we need to um, initiate the mass transfusion protocol, which I'm pretty sure every hospital has something like that. Um, if that is the case and they are rapidly losing blood, the recommendation is to treat it like a trauma. You actually give one unit of packed red blood cells, one unit of FFP, and one unit of platelet, and you keep going with that ratio. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why you could deviate from this, but that is a good starting point to just say, let's just start replacing everything. Um, I believe that's how it's done in this hospital is the one to one to one ratio. But like I said, there's reasons not to. So I added this in here. This isn't really an emergency though. It can become an emergency. Um, pediatric inductions. Uh, they wanted me to talk a little bit about this. So this is, when I say pediatric inductions, I don't necessarily mean every pediatric induction. What I'm talking about is inhalation inductions really for pediatric patients. We get pediatric patients come, they don't have an IV, and so we think it's easier, and it is a lot of the time, to just give them an inhalational anesthetic to go to sleep, and then we'll start an IV on them. Um, it's arguable as to which one is less traumatizing to the child, but whatever. Um, so if a kid doesn't have an IV, there, we start talking about doing inhalation induction. There are criteria you need to meet. One of them is that you have to be NPO. I can't do an inhalation induction on you if you have uh, a lot of food in your stomach or whatever, or, or any of those reasons that you could have like some massive aspiration. Because there's gonna be a period in time where you have no airway other than what you can produce naturally. Um, a patient can't be too big, and by big I mean obese. The more tissue you have, uh, well, no, I take that back. Big can just be an adult, right? Um, 
they seem to have more airway issues when we run into that. Um, if they already have airway issues, any sort of abnormalities, they're going to preclude me from doing an inhalation induction or some things that are slightly scary, I'm not going to want that to happen. Um, so here's kind of how a pediatric induction works. Uh, it sounds very simple. Put a mask on the kid's face. There's gas, volatile gas on board. Kid breathes that in, fills their lungs up with that agent. It gets sucked into the bloodstream. That goes to the patient's head, soaks into their brain, and they go to sleep. Okay? So there's two different ways to accomplish that. There, actually, there's lots of ways to accomplish it. There's only two correct ways to accomplish it, and safe ways. I, I refer to them as slow and fast. So uh, a cooperative kid, you can do a slow inhalation induction on. This is where um, you kind of talk them into letting, most kids don't really want strange guys uh, putting like stuff over the face. And so um, we can put some scents in the mask or something like that, have them breathe. What I usually do is turn on some nitrous oxide because then it kind of cooks them up a little bit and they're like, this is silly. And I'm like, yeah, nothing bad's gonna happen. And um, I will slowly increase the volatile agent. Nitrous won't, you can't really give enough nitrous oxide to full on put you under general anesthesia. Um, but I can start mixing other stuff slowly enough that by the time you realize you're breathing really stinky anesthesia gas, you're already pretty, you're already heading out. Um, so I'll slowly increase the agent. This allows the kid to deepen to a safer point of anesthesia that uh, we can then, you know, do an IV or whatever we need to do. For kids that will not participate in that, we do what I call a fast induction. Some people call this a crash induction. Um, this is usually on the kicking, screaming kids. I will just turn the knob all the way up to as high as it will go. We'll hold the mask on their face. They're gonna scream a bunch and kick and have a really bad time. Um, but what this does is it very quickly pushes them through the different stages of anesthetic into deeper stages. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's not very fun. It's not fun for me to do. It's for sure, for sure not fun for a parent to watch, which a lot of times in Indo we have parents watching their kids go to sleep. Um, it's not fun for the kid, but it has a method to it. What you don't want to do is put on a mask, take off a mask, put on a mask, take off a mask. What you end up doing is getting a patient right into stage two, kind of, of their sleep cycle, and that's where you run into laryngospasms. That's where you run into aspiration. That's where you run into apnea and just weird things um, that all occurs under that not very deep plane of anesthesia. Once you go to deeper planes of anesthesia, um, you will actually breathe better and very regular and things like that. And so um, it's kind of counterintuitive, but if I can get you to deeper planes of anesthesia quicker, it's actually safer for you. Um, so I try, I hopefully do a good job of like expressing that to the family of the mom and be like, look, I don't want to have to hold your kid down, but here's why I'm doing it. There's, it actually comes from a place of safety. Um, so once we get to a certain level, we do the IV. For the most part, pretty much everybody that works in Indo has seen it enough that they kind of know when there's that safe point. But occasionally, there, I'll be looking at a monitor. If the kid is breathing irregularly, it is probably not a good idea to start an IV at that point. That stimulation can lighten their plane of anesthesia a little bit to where they can laryngospasm and have issues. Um, I was doing some locums at a children's hospital in California. They, have, they make it a huge deal because they're doing so many inhalation inductions. No one touches the kid until anesthesia goes, okay, you may now do the IV. And it's like such a strict thing there. I don't think we need to go that crazy, but um, I definitely understand the value in not grabbing their arm and immediately starting an IV. You can actually precipitate problems with doing that. And so with that, I'm done.